Since the first human settlement, a rise in demographics has gone hand in hand with an increase in construction activity. Construction is one of the core engines of the real economy, creating employment, supporting growth, and improving health. But also, the use of construction as a weapon of colonization, the destruction of the planet's ecological balance, an everyday reminder of social inequality and gentrification. So what can construction do to save the world? And what kind of world are we living in? We have the pleasure today to talk about the future of construction with the former UK government chief advisor, Peter Ansford. Well, we've got 140 trade bodies in this industry. Mm -hmm. What do you need 140 trade bodies for? Right. You try talking to them like I've had to in the last three years, and that's a nightmare. And every week you find a new one. But, you know, we all seem to... And need... yet, everybody's paying their subs to these trade bodies, so they must be adding some value. Why would people... Well, there might be a perception that they add value. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, BIM um, has created the biggest wave of enthusiasm and pride regarding reducing fragmentation. In has many, that worked? In many it has, yeah. Um, yeah, it was working. But these, right. we're such a um, slow-moving industry mm -hmm. in terms of evolution. Is that because of the burden of our legacy? Ah. I don't know. Um, no, I think we're just um, risk averse. Right, right. Hugely risk averse. And yet, the margins in this industry, if you look at the margins of the tier one contractors in particular, and just use those as an example, you know, they're pathetically small. They're, companies are surviving on one and a half percent profit margin. Why do it? What's the point? And, they don't, and the point is they don't need to. There are, uh, with BIM, with um, off-site manufacturing, with all sorts of supply chain issues, uh, supply chain integration, they can be much more profitable. And if they're more profitable, they'll invest more in people. Um, uh, the image will improve. It's all circular. Wouldn't you agree um, that transparency could be a great enabler in mitigating risk early on um, big project and small projects alike, uh, in a way that you know we could actually know a little bit more of what we're doing. You know, part of the issue, you know, being an active actor in the construction is that um, information is not always there when you need it. Um, and and sure. you, no, I you, agree. you bring a lot of risk agree. along with you. I agree, and a lot of inefficiency. Yeah. huge inefficiency. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think transparency has a lot to offer. I think we you we adopt out, outdated processes mm -hmm. as an industry. Um, we've always done it this way, yeah. so therefore we're very suspicious of change, and that's holding back the industry. And I think that's is true in, t in the use of technology, is in the use of new uh, procurement techniques, in the use of, um, of BIM and, 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 and digital opportunities. A lot of it is about conservatism and the conservatism of the leadership of our industry. Yeah, but that's understandable in a way because you said there's very um, kind of thin margins um, and yeah. I should stop promoting Apple here. Um, thin margins, great risks um, and, and less um, government, um, you know, give us a kick in terms of uh, mandating targets. I'm thinking on BIM. Yeah, no, 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 I, I agree. But, 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 you know, look at other industries. Mm -hmm. uh, look at automotive industry. Look at aerospace. Um, these industries um, are very innovative. These industries are very fast to adopt technology. Um, presumably the data is very transparent. I don't know. It's not something I've looked at. Um, and you have to ask yourself, why? You know, why have they done it? And what, or, or more importantly, why is construction not? And my conclusion is that they had to. Mm. Um, if you take, well, let's take them both. If you take the automotive industry, um, in the 1970s and early 80s, it was on its knees. Um, the UK had no um, uh, sustainable um, automotive industry. Um, 
and it either had to die, which it could have done, or it had to radically change itself in order to survive. Um, uh, it had foreign threats, particularly Japanese, um, and so it had a burning bridge. It had a reason to change. Right. And it changed. Uh, if you take defence industry, a um, bit more complex. Uh, I don't mean defence, I mean aerospace, but a lot of it's defence. A um, bit more complex, but again, it had a real need to change because of the competitive forces from Boeing, from, uh, you know, I think probably in, in aerospace, much of it was US competition. And construction hasn't had that. Construction prides itself in being able to adapt and change and modify. But the problem with that is the changes are incremental mm -hmm. and it doesn't have a burning bridge. And it, it, we need a burning bridge. We need a disruptive technology, a disruptive um, force yeah. to make construction change. BIM might be it, but I'm not sure it is. Still, fragmentation is, is where we fall short of different in, of areas of you know, uh, competitive industries where uh, skills can be attracted in a more efficient way and retained in a more efficient way, while our diversity, which sometimes is seen as a benefit, um, is our weakest point. Yeah, but it's, it, this goes back to what I was saying about how our industry has evolved and adapted, and, you know, um, many, many small companies spring up across our industry. That's a good thing, mm -hmm. um, but we don't see the medium-sized companies disappearing. Yeah, I think in my, in my um, perception or, or my understanding of, of successful industries, you end up with some very large players that are efficient, that can lead, that can invest, um, and you end up with some very small players who can be very innovative, they can be very fleet of foot, you know. Um, but there's, there's, I don't think in a really healthy market there's room for the middle players. Mm -hmm. And yet in construction we've got lots of them. The majority of workforce is employed by SMEs, no? Yeah, well, many of them are M's right. in the SMEs. Right. Um, and, um, and so what I see in the future is over time that disappearing sort of a squeeze, it's like a, a wine glass effect yeah. um, or an hourglass effect where you get more going to the big companies and maybe more small companies um, building up but less in the middle and I think that's healthy um, and I think, I think we're going to see that with more foreign competition on infrastructure projects like HS2, um, not just HS2 but you know I think that will be the, the driver, uh, I hope that will be the, the driver that, that changes our industry more rapidly. When we did a campaign last year um, on the image of the industry, yeah. um, we had a fantastic event here, hosted by the RIBA, and the entire panel um, agreed um, with our opinion that it's not the big projects, it's not the big infrastructural commissions um, responsible for the not so good image we provide to yeah, society. No, um, so, you know, do you think the market on its own will sort out itself uh, and eventually the small players will disappear and we will leave it to the big organisation to ensure that our uh, image is, con is consistent? I think some, some of that. Um, I think, I mean, you're right. I mean, if you just go back, if you look at one factor of image, which is health and safety, and so I know it's only one, but if you look at that, the big projects have been exceptionally good on uh, health and safety. Um, uh, we're sitting here in HS2 today, and before they let me into the meeting room, I had to have a safety induction at reception. I was most impressed. Um, and um, But the big companies are, or the big projects, are the exemplars for the industry. Um, they lead the way. Um, they can drag the rest of the industry with them. So yes, the image of the industry is particularly poor on smaller projects, 
Um, but I think the big big projects have got a responsibility to help drag the rest of the industry through. I agree up to a certain point. Um, I'd, I also think that big organisations um, just do not have the flexibility and the speed um, to capture the entire no. diversity of innovation. No. Um, and I, if I look at the IT sector, um, uh, I'm impressed how quickly uh, good ideas can become incredibly good business. Yeah. Um, so I, I wonder you know, what could construction learn uh, from the Silicon Valley? Well, I think construction could learn a great deal from Silicon Valley. But you see, the Silicon Valley isn't burdened by 200, 300 years of um, the way we've always done it. Um, which is back to the point about how our industry is so slow to change. So I think in, 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 in industries like the IT industry, change is um, accepted as a way of life. It's, it's what you do, it's, it's survival. Um, and I think constructions hasn't got to that point yet. We have to. Oh, I think it hasn't got to that point yet. We have to. No, you're absolutely right. I mean, I have a view that this is quite, this is all circular. That, um, and I don't know where you start on the circle, but you know, new technology results in um, greater efficiency, which results in greater profitability, which enables investment, uh, investment in people, in processes, in research, um, which makes the industry more attractive to, um, to young people and also to people from other industries because it's a, it's, it's a fast moving industry which in itself improves the image and it's circular. So we've got, we've got to break into that circle and I think technology is the place to break in. I would also think that uh, historically um, innovation um, has led the market to become more efficient, productive, um, predictable, and therefore machines could, to a, to a certain extent, replace workforce. I mean, we've seen that in industrial revolutions. We've seen that all throughout the 50s. Um, now, you know, artificial intelligence applied to yeah. big data mining um, and robotics, yeah. um, you know, could really halve the need for workforce on our sites and offices. And we and we are starting to see that, but it's very slow. Um, and again, where where's the burning bridge? You know, construction must need to change. Um, and you, you, you would think that very low profit margins is a burning bridge. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to be. People manage to survive somehow and carry on. I think the burning bridge might be the need for more resources. Mm -hmm. um, and then I agree with you entirely. Rather than bringing more people, do things more productively, use technology, get the same work done with half the workforce, doesn't mean cutting workforce because a lot of our workforce could retire anyway. You know, we've got this demographic bubble in construction where the average age of a construction worker in the UK is 49 or something. Um, so uh, it's not many years before they're going to be leaving the industry anyway. So replacing them not with, not totally with new people, new younger people although we do need those, but actually replacing them with, with technology, uh, robotics, drones, off-site construction, industrial process. This is the exciting bit, and this then improves the image. Is the burning bridge perhaps coming from uh, the change in demand? You know, by 2050, uh, the UK will be the biggest uh, country in the EU zone. We're going to go from 64 yeah. million to 77 million, like 24% increase. Um, also with that, there will be um, um, a shift in the uh, average age of UK citizens. So it will be, you know, it will be an, yeah, an yeah. aging population and the ratio between work, oh, see, yeah. working population and retired population will also change you know, pushing even more the financial system and uh, the public debt. Um, so, so is there perhaps an issue in the way the supply side um, is aware of the future change in demand? 
Maybe. The problem in, in what you just said is it happens slowly. Mm. And because it's happen, happened slowly, the industry adapts. And the whole principle of a burning bridge is it happens quickly. Right. Um, so it's disruptive. And people have to change quickly. Um, no time to adapt. Uh, and that's when you start seeing big change. I go back, that's when we saw big change in the automotive industry because the changes had to happen over a period of two, three, five years, not over a period of 20, 30 years. Um, so, uh, and the same will be true in aerospace uh, and other industries that have transformed themselves. So, it's fine that burning bridge, it really is, that's the key. And I always thought that the other issue with the burning bridge um, is that there is no a consistent collective shared uh, image of how the burning bridge looks like. So you say things are changing, yet they're changing very slowly. And the image I have in my mind is the boiled frog. Yeah, oh, the boiled frog. I, uh, I'm a great fan of the boiled frog principle. And you're right, that's exactly what's happening. Um, it's a boiled frog situation. Um, and partly, we talked earlier about fragmentation. Um, there's no collective leadership in our industry. You know, where would, where would a vision or an understanding of the need for change, where would it reside? Um, and so one of the things I've been trying to do over the last three years is to bring together the industry in more collective leadership. And that's the whole principle behind the industrial strategy that we created under the coalition government and the Construction Leadership Council, a forum where we can get a shared understanding of um, the issues, a, sh a shared vision of the future, and a collective resolve to, uh, to work on it. And it's absolutely crucial we do that. And how do you do that in an industry with so many players, trade bodies, professional institutions, uh, unless they start talking with a collective voice. And how do we do that if, at the end of the day, the demand side, our clients, um, are not driving change? I, you know, I, I know, I know it's about who's holding the pencil and you know, who's actually got the, the chance uh, to change the way we work. Um, yet, I mean, we, we do struggle providing a clear um, understanding, representation, explanation of what's going on. We are responsible for 40% of CO2 emissions in this country, yeah. we as an industry, uh, but it's invisible. You, you don't see it. I think we need to be careful not to put all the responsibility on clients. I think clients have got an important role to play, and clients have a very important role to play. Government's the biggest client in construction um, in the UK, so government has a big responsibility um, and then we've got the major infrastructure projects, many of which are significantly funded by the public purse. Um, so clients do have a big role to play, but there is a risk that the industry steps back and says, well, unless our clients tell us to do it, we're not going to do it. And I think that's very dangerous. And I think that is where the position we're in at the moment. Yeah. So I think we've got to get to a position where our industry wants to change irrespective of what our clients want. In fact, our industry forces that change in the clients. We're starting to see some of that, you know, the stuff that Ray O'Rourke's doing um, with Inspire and off-site construction and, and forcing more modular construction, forcing, is he forcing? Certainly encouraging more modular construction um, through the design process. I actually believe part of the problem is architects. Hmm. I really do. Uh, and uh, I, I would like to see our architects become much bolder. Uh, I don't mean bolder in terms of, you know, um, Zaha did type designs, which are great, that's fantastic. But I mean bolder in terms of understanding the design, construction, manufacturing process and designing to encourage that. I'll take that 
uh, my fellow architects, um, and we will develop a, manif a, a manifesto. Uh, we'll get back to Jane and, and discuss that. Um, I still believe that in a competitive market, where organizations have tight R&D budgets and they need to deliver and they need to compete and the margins are you know, what they are, um, where do we find the, re the resources to turn huge ships? Okay. The first thing we must do is not accept that margins are where they are. Mm -hmm. We've got to fix it. We have to change it. So how do we fix it? We fix it by cutting out huge inefficiencies. Yes. We waste so much money in this industry. So if we can do things in a much more efficient way, which means better collaboration, it means less interfaces, therefore larger and less organizations. Um, so if we can do things in more efficient ways, we can become more profitable. I want this to be a, be a significantly more profitable industry. That's not a bad thing, that's a really good thing. Because when you've got profit, You've then got the opportunity to invest, and you invest in people, bring in the best, uh, make it a really great company to work for, and people will want to join you, so that requires investment. You invest in process, um, make it more efficient, BIM, um, off-site construction, all of these things come into that category, and you invest in research. Our industry spends a pitiful sum on research. I mean, we all know that the pharmaceutical industry spends a great deal of money on research and, 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 and always has done. But look at other industries like auto and aero. Their research spend is, is massive compared with construction. But that's where we should be investing our, our money. And we can't invest it if it's not there. So step one, become profitable. To do that, yeah. I still think that uh, lack of information um, is one of our yeah. Yeah. biggest hurdles. You, know, you, you could imagine any project, infrastructure or building a property project, you would uh, be able to track all along the timeline where better information would be needed. Yeah. Um, and I think, as I said earlier, BIM is just the tip of the iceberg because what happens before and after the building is really what matters. So there's, there's a huge, huge hurdle there um, in providing all clients with the evidence of what they should be asking for. Yeah. Um, so, so to completely open up the planning system, to completely open up supply chains um, information, it would allow peer-to-peer -peer reviews yeah. of what we need, but also a vertical um, transparency mechanism I agree with you 100%. The question is, now I'm asking the question, I mean, the question is, how do you break into that? How do you, how do you, how do you make it imperative that data flows in the way that you describe? I think the way you do it is that um, companies that do not do that, companies that get in the way of that, have to go out of business. You know, um, it's got to, that is the way that you lose money by mm -hmm. being inefficient. Because it really comes into the efficiency bit. So, um, on the one hand, we need some exemplars. We need some people that are really using data to fantastic advantage and demonstrably um, making money out of it. That's good. People follow that. And on the other hand, we need some that, that, that go bust, frankly, because they're being very inefficient with their data. And then we need to give, um, we need to communicate that. We need to give visibility to the difference that good data makes. I think data literacy, so our own skills in the data world, will increase as soon as the demand for open data increases too. So I would like large clients not only to ask for the architecture and the engineering of buildings, but also to ask for the architecture and the engineering on the database that comes with the building. Um, and in that, yeah. every single project is an opportunity for a construction sector open data format. But you're talking, you're talking BIM level three language. Um, 
I think you are. I'm talking about social value of yeah, data. Yeah, I know you are, but that's what BIM lived for three years. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, BIM is in its infancy, frankly. Uh, we're getting some really good value out of BIM, but it's in its infancy. The opportunities from BIM are massive. Now, I don't pretend to be an expert in this area, but you know, once you get into connecting to the Internet of Things, you know, looking at the outputs, um, managing the performance of your assets during the operational um, phase, because that's where that's where the big costs are. Yeah, and the construction, the design costs are tiny. Construction costs are quite small. I mean, you know this diagram that I'm visually drawing here. This is the the, the Don Ward diagram, but the in use costs are quite big. And the social benefits are massive. So we've got to be driving from that end. I think we're talking the same thing. We're talking that. It's almost disappointing to be in agreement. But what I think is quite interesting is that in this um, incremental expansion of costs, um, you would also overlay a incremental reduction of the possibility of tracking um, data. We're very good at measuring buildings. Yeah, we always yeah, yeah. do measuring buildings. Now we use digital um, tools to measure buildings. Yeah. When it comes to measuring the outcome, you know, you know, how much has this building or this square reduced knife crime? Yeah. You know, how much this school, this school has improved children's happiness? Yeah. You know, can we deliver yeah. against those values? Yeah, and I, I, I think the answer is at the moment we probably can't. We almost certainly can't. But it's really exciting. You know, this is where I think social science, um, science and engineering start coming together. So stop thinking, and I, th I think some of this goes to our schools and, and universities, stop thinking silos, stop thinking about um, you know, your faculty of engineering that has nothing to do with those strange people down the road at the faculty of social science. Actually, the, the, the combination of the two can be really powerful, and um, so we've got to be making those connections. Um, I think some universities are, th are now thinking that way, mm -hmm. which is good. I think schools are not thinking that way at all, which is bad. Um, and, uh, and I think, I mean, you've heard me say this many times, but I think an area that we've really got to be focusing on is schools, maybe even primary schools, but certainly people that... Teachers, I think, is where we really got to be aiming at, and and teachers of people aged nine, ten, eleven, and and excite them about the opportunities, not just in building the built environment, but in operating the built environment, and therefore, what is the role of social science um, as as part of the solution here? I agree with you. I, I I know you don't want me to be agreeing with you, but I do. Uh, underlying to all this, couldn't we then? agree yet again once more that the burning bridge is um, evidence-driven data management. Eventually we want no, to be able to tell society... I can't agree on that. You see, the thing about a burning bridge mm. is you know it's burning and you know you've got to do something about it now. And if you don't do something about it now, you're going to suffer. And I don't think we've got to that point yet. Now, intellectually, you might say, well, of course we have. But until, until Mr. Cameron's got there, until um, the head teacher at the school over there in Poplar's got there, until um, the BBC's got there, then I think we haven't reached the burning bridge. Okay, is that too much then to say that um, the future is the burning bridge? The global balances of environmental change, rising demographics, migration, um, and uh, you know, rising in, in financial powers outside the UK. All this creates the case for action. I'm sure, but people have got to feel it. A burning bridge is hot. You can feel the heat. So you can't ignore it. You can't say, well, some other scientist is going to come up with an opposing view in a few years time so let me not bother changing now you know which is what people have done with climate change for years as you know 
Um, you got to feel it. You got to really know it. Um, the floods in Cumbria this week, I think, is a real sign that for I think more and more people are now starting to say, "Oh yeah, maybe there is something in this climate change thing," which to many of us has kind of been a no-brainer for ten years now. Um, so, but you have to feel it. So, so we've got to find a way of of um, of 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 really um, making politicians, society, the media, uh, school, I think those are the main areas, um, really recognize that this is not something that's academic and interesting and probably right, but something that's got to be dealt with today. Paris has to make a decision today, not next year or sometime before I completely retire. Uh, they've got to make it today. Burning bridge. Do, do you think that the level of awareness and engagement and empathy that people out there have for the climate change um, and our future threat uh, are comparable to, say, the human rights campaign in the 60s? I mean, is there still capacity out there for engagement to speed up things? Yeah, huge capacity for engagement. Um, we've even still got politicians that deny climate change. How scary is that? Mm. But we have um, some quite prominent ones. We've got very large chunks of the media who are not really, don't really think this is an important issue. Um, things have changed considerably in the last five years. Um, and hopefully we've reached a tipping point but we might not have done. What is also a bit scary um, is how diverse, different, fragmented is the um, level of awareness of what climate change is. Yeah. What is interesting though, is somewhat promising, is that if you ask anyone below the age of 35, yeah. they would say, yes, it is an issue, it is a problem not quite the same response you'd have for someone of a different age group, let's put it mildly. No, you're right. Um, so is it a generational issue? And if, it, if it's that is even marginally the case, how do we tackle that? Because we, we know how old our leaders are. Ah, okay. Well, I think it is a generational issue. I'm not sure when you reach the, the ripe old age of 36, you stop thinking that way. Um, what I'm saying is I'm not sure it's as cut and dried as mm. below above or below 35, but, but, but I think it is a generational issue. But you know, it's like any social change. You therefore have got to either find um, people of the older generation that, 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 that buy the cause and that, that can, um, that can um, uh, champion it, or you've got to have people under 35 um, making the decisions. My last question then would be about where do we aim? Um, there's a beautiful bit in uh, Machiavelli's Principe um, about um, uh, you know a, a good archer would aim a lot higher, as he knows that the parabola that yeah. the arrow uh, follows uh, would actually drag the uh, output, uh, the target, a lot lower. Um, so, are we wrong? in aiming exactly for what we want? Should we be aiming a lot higher? And, and should our policies and campaign um, follow on a higher level of engagement and, and movement? I'm sure it should be much higher. Um, there is a risk that if you go so high, um, you then switch other people off and it becomes, the, you know, seen as being idealism and, you know, theory and impractical. So you probably, I don't know, I'm, 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 I'm not an archer, but um, I guess if I had a, if I had a whole um, team of archers, I'd, I'd have some of them aiming up here, but some actually aiming here as well, you know, if, if that analogy works. Um, you've got to tackle this on all levels. Um, 
but yeah, you really need to aim high. What about our young archers? What should we tell them to do? What should you tell the young archers? Follow their heart. And not be, not be discouraged by the older, the people that haven't yet seen the light. And perhaps, you know, social media and, and networks of individuals could, could provide the alternative to um, the not so good uh, communication protocols and knowledge transfer that big organisations sometimes suffer from. Yeah, I'm sure that's right. Um, but I think, I think the young people should um, try and bring the older people with them. Uh huh. You know, there can be the arrogance of the young. We know the answers. It's obvious. You know, um, that's fine. But actually, you got to make change happen, and uh, and that means turning the um, the the super tanker. Um, so I think probably actually we. Fragmentation is um, is featuring quite highly in this interview. Um, maybe fra fragmentation of the um, generations is another big issue. Yep. And maybe we've got to get much more integration in thinking across the generations. There's a thought for you. We'll work on that. <laughs>